Coming up this week, the first look at the brand new Intellivision console. The Atari Jaguar flash car is finally here. And we talked to the man behind some of the biggest video game magazines ever, Steve Jarrett joins us. This week's show is brought to you by Bitmap Books and their incredible new Metal Slug The Ultimate History Book. Pre-orders are open right now. Head to bitmapbooks.co.uk. And The Economist, the smart guide to the forces changing your world. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 187. Your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Parks. And right at the start of the final bank holiday weekend of the year here in Britain. The weather's set to be beautiful. So a good excuse to sit indoors for three days and play retro games. Yeah, I think I'm going to do a a bank holiday (laughs) DJ set that should be some good fun. (laughs) You know what, though? It just kind of scared me how quickly this year is going by. I actually was in my uh, supermarket the other day. They've already got the Halloween section out. That's crazy. And then we'll be talking about stuff that we might want in our Christmas stocking this year in a few months' time. Now, there is something, actually. I've spotted, I mentioned this to my missus. I said, the Atari Jaguar flashcards finally here. She's like, what's that? So that is something that I had to buy myself. But the wait is finally over now. We need to talk about that in just a bit. But think about when we were kids as well. I mean, you think of the summer holidays. What a magical time that was. When you had six weeks off school, all you had to do was play video games. Yeah, I was healthy. I went outside. <laughs> Rabbi. Uh, no, no, it, it was a bit of a mix for me. It was video games all day and then I would go out in the evening and play football and run around and stuff yeah when I come back I play games so. oh no we were reverse reverse yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I used to cheat I had a Game Boy so yeah I could do both <laughs> oh, well, yeah, there was a lot of Pokemon going on as well <laughs> but I mean one thing that we, we used to love doing back in the day not only playing games but reading about them as well now today on the podcast we're going to be joined by this man I mean I don't use the word lightly he is a veteran of the video games industry if I tell you a few of the titles that our guest today was involved with, Edge Magazine. Oh, that was such a cool mag. He was a launch editor of Edge Magazine. He's also the launch editor of the official PlayStation UK magazine. Now, do you remember everybody? You'd always look through anyone at school who had a PlayStation, go through their boxes. Do you remember those cover CDs? It'd all be different colours. Yeah, the demo discs, yeah. How amazing were they? Yeah, I had hundreds of them because my cousin used to, he was subscribed to PlayStation UK magazine, so he'd just give them to us every single time he got one, like after he'd played it. Amazing, amazing, amazing. They were godsend, weren't they? Kind of before the internet, that was the yeah. way that you'd get all your stuff. So he also worked at Amiga Format, and I remember getting the discs with all the utilities, the drivers, all the stuff that I needed would be on that floppy disk every single month. And he's involved in Total Magazine as well. That was the first UK official Nintendo magazine. He did S, the Sega Mag, the first officially licensed Sega magazine in the UK. He worked on Crash. He worked on Zep64. He's got quite good credentials, I guess, today. Yeah, I think he's uh, been around the block by the sounds of things when it comes to retro games. So this is Steve Jarrett. Now, he's got some great stories about... I mean, we do mention it in the interview. This is really the golden age of video games magazines. It is a bit sad. I mean, the only real like gaming mag that I read these days, I get Retro Gamer most months, but I mean, magazines are not really the go-to place for gaming news anymore. You know, it used to be amazing. I'd walk in and there'd be like at least five Amiga magazines. Then yeah. there'd be Acorn. Then there'd yeah. be all the console stuff as well. And now it's like a tiny little section next to fishing or camping or something like that. <laughs> yeah, for me, it's a bit of a ritual whenever I go abroad. I always have to buy you know, going to WH Smith's at the airport and buy a magazine. And it's becoming frequently harder to actually find something. Usually it's retro, it's retro gamer magazine. Yeah. You know, which is fine. That's great. But like, I can't actually find anything modern. Do you yeah. know what I mean? But like you say, I think it's just the world we live in now. Yeah. I mean, the time back then, pre-internet, magazines could make or break a game. Yeah. It was so important. So we're going to get the story behind. I mean, not just one or two, pretty much all of the major UK magazines from that decade, um, the mid-80s to the mid-90s, with Steve Jarrett. He's going to be on our show in around 15 minutes from now. Now, we do like reading. There is something about sitting down with a physical product and reading about in-depth stories about video games. Well, I don't know about you, but I looking, like looking at pictures. Yeah, well, yeah. You've always been a bit, a bit of a pictorial kind of guy, yeah. Well, actually, this thing we're going to talk about right now, it combines both of those, actually. Great text, great articles, and also lovely pictures as well. Now, this is our good friends at bitmapbooks.co.uk who are celebrating one of the biggest gaming franchises in history, Metal Slug. Now, are you still spending all your time playing Metal Slug? So, I've now downloaded every available Metal Slug game on Xbox One and completed them and got the 1,000 gamer score. 
So nerding out on Metal Slug at the moment, so really, really, really looking forward to this book coming out in November. Because we saw him coming today and you said, oh, he must have been working a bit too hard recently. It's not your job that's causing it. No, it's not the job. It's staying up at night trying to get high scores on Metal Slug. (laughs) And, you know, I was looking at the systems that Metal Slug's been released on and it's so many different systems. It's absolutely crazy. It's like Paperboy. You name it, it's been on it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it started in 1996, so, I mean, it's a well-established franchise. And this book is called Metal Slug, The Ultimate History. Now, this is the first officially endorsed Metal Slug history book by SNK. And it's the first of its kind. Not only will they give you the really rich history behind this incredible franchise, but also there are hundreds of images in here as well. I saw Joe's eyes perk up there. Pretty pretty pictures in here too. (laughs) Uh, Screenshots and also there is concept artwork in here that has never been published or seen before. 11 exclusive, incredibly detailed interviews with key members of the development team. And also, one thing I think is really cool in here as well, it explores the roots of Metal Slug and also looks at, you know, titles like uh, In the Hunt and Gun Force 2 and how these arcade games influence what was to become later in the Metal Slug series. So there's a lot in here if you're a fan of the series. I mean, this is a must-buy. I think that's really interesting as well because of, I always found In the Hunt really interest, a really interesting game and how that was kind of a segue into Metal Slug. So I yeah. think that's really... Really, really cool that they've got that in there. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, so Bitmap Books have been a big supporter of our podcast. We need you to do this right now, okay? Have a look on their website at bitmapbooks.co.uk. Pre-orders are open right now, and the books are going to be delivered in November. And like at first, I thought, oh, that's quite a while away. It's only like, what, just over two, two months, months away, away yeah, now? Like... <laughs> indication of how quick this year is going. So you'll have it in time for Christmas, which I think is really cool. You know, if you're already thinking about little presents, maybe to yourself, like I am, uh, have a look on the website right now, bitmapbooks.co.uk. Check out Metal Slug at the Ultimate History. Bitmap Books have been a massive supporter of our podcast, so we'd appreciate you showing them a bit of love. Have a look at bitmapbooks.co.uk and check out Metal Slug at the Ultimate History. Now, before we get into our chat with Steve Jarrod, speaking of people we love, the Retro Hour podcast could not continue without people who make a little donation and find their place in the most prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming. There is no more prestigious a high score table, is it, than the... The Retro Hour Hall of Fame. I think this is the most prestigious one in the all of internet. At least. So if you want to find your place in there, all you have to do is help out the running of this show. Now, we call it a little tip jar. So essentially, if you like what we do, I mean, we do have sponsors on the show from time to time, but everything we get through donations all goes back into the running of the podcast. Pays for our services, pays for the hosting, editing license, all that kind of thing. And for doing that of any amount at all, you'll find your place in the Hall of Fame. Just like this week... Michael Daly. Jasper Hoyer. Mark Trainer, David Blumenstein. Who all made donations into the running of the show. And if you'd like to do the same, you'll find all the information in the supporter section of the RetroHour.com. Now, we've been loving these kind of updated retro consoles recently. One, though, that I think has actually got a bit of potential is the reboot of the Intellivision brand. And we finally get a little glimpse of the new Intellivision console, the Amico. Yeah, so as we all know, it's been Gamescom in Germany, and Gamescom is the kind of biggest video game show in the world. So people have all been going there, we've been getting a lot of announcements, and the first one's been this um, Amico trailer, the Intellivision Amico. Now, what is the Intellivision Amico? It's a new console that's been bought by... Tommy Talalico and he's basically a video game veteran and he's got a lot of exclusive games that are coming. How many games are in this video? Well, at the moment they've done a little teaser and this is it's a couple of minute long trailer. Tommy's interviewed in it as well and it shows really quickly 17 games that are exclusive to this new Intellivision console. Now bear in mind we're a year away from launch yet. Yeah. It's not going to be out until October 2020. But, I mean, there's an article here that I'll link up in our show notes on uh, lilliputing.com. And they're talking about, I mean, it says here, I hope you like 1980s style 2D graphics because that's what you're going to get. But looking at this trailer, they don't look that retro to me. No, so the, the, the thing that Tommy was saying in the trailer, he was saying, you know, modern gaming, it's far too complex. It's not pick up and play. If you want to play something like, I don't know, player unknown battlegrounds or something, yeah. you've got to learn all the techniques, you've got to learn all the key combinations and everything. And he wants to take it back to that kind of sim- simple way of gaming. And uh, 
you know, we saw versions of uh, Breakout and Snake in there, but there was also a thing that looked like Echo the Dolphin at the end. Yeah, uh, Ravi was like, Echo the Dolphin's on there. And I was like, it looks like Echo the Dolphin, but it's not confirmed I, I'm yet. sure I'd heard rumours of uh, yeah. the actual guy working with him. And even though they have this Earthworm Jim exclusive, surprisingly, that wasn't in the trailer. Yeah. <laughs> I was literally about to say that Earthworm Jim wasn't on there, was it? Yeah, and that, like... there is going to be an exclusive Earthworm Jim game on the new television mm. console. Which could be a system seller. I mean, at the moment, the saying, again, like you said then, Ravi, this is not aimed at, you know, probably us guys, really. It's yeah. not aimed at guys who've got a PlayStation 4 and a Switch and all that kind of thing. What they're looking at here is family gaming on the couch, and they're talking about there will be motion control games on here, there'll be party games. But there's, there's no violence or bad language. Yeah. You know, the games are rated E for everybody. Yeah. And, uh, Educational titles is going to be on here as well. Card games, sports games. Under £200 as well, but also, I think, uh, uh, $200, sorry. Also, I think that another thing that uh, they're going to get is five games packed in. Right. Which is pretty interesting, getting five games on launch. They're also saying all the games are going to be between two ninety nine and nine ninety nine as well, which I think is quite interesting. And there's going to be no DLC or in-app purchases. It, it kind of brings it back to those like budget-style titles, yeah. doesn't it? Uh, yeah, look, look at these games. Some of them do look a bit like they could be kind of souped up mobile games of it. Yeah, this is my problem. This is like my issue with it. It looks really cool and it looks really nice, but are we just going to have another uh, ooh ah? Yeah. Ooh ah, how do you say it? Ooh ah. Ooh ya. Ooh ya. Ooh ya. <laughs> on our hand. Ooh ya. Are we going to have another ooh ya on our hands? You know, is it going to be a paperweight by 2021? Again, any of these systems live or die by the games that come out on them. I think yeah. one thing that is cool about what Tommy's trying to do is. The fact that they're they're trying to get exclusives. So the thing with the OER is pretty much all its library could get on Android, and yeah, yeah, that, that's probably what killed that. And in this article, they're also saying, you know, oh, he's gonna have a, a chance against the PlayStation Five. I don't think he's going against the no, PlayStation Five. Not. It's gonna be the Switch market and the casual gamers, the iPad gamers. You know, that's gonna be the area that they're going into. Yeah. It's not gonna be against the new uh, Project Scarlet Xbox handheld thingy. And they're talking about the fact that the console will come with, um, you know, Bluetooth controllers, motion controls going to be built into it too, touch screens, microphones going to be built into it. So it does kind of seem like, it maybe seems a bit like kind of where the Wii left off. Yeah. Whether there's a market for that anymore, time will tell, I guess. I don't know, they're going to have to have, to have a uh, pretty big marketing campaign, I think, yeah. to get your nan to buy it, to be honest. Yeah, well, I think <laughs> if, if anyone can kind of get an independent console out there and make it a success, I mean... Tommy's got pedigree, and yeah. people we've talked about it on the show before. People who worked on Xbox and that in the past are working with him now. You know, did the market yeah. the original system. So, you know, I think out of all of them, it's probably got more of a fighting chance than a lot of them. And, which, and you yeah. never know what he has planned. It could be the first one gains a little traction, and then suddenly something big comes. You don't know. Come on the show, Tommy. Yep. Tell, us, tell us the details. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you want to find out more about that and check out that trailer, I'll put it in the show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, I did mention it at the top of the show, and look, I don't expect you guys to get excited about it. I like the Atari Jaguar. Do you, Dan? <laughs> I've been waiting for this for years. Everdrives, I think, are great. You know, these little flash carts that you can plug into your old systems. They're kind of the best of both worlds, really, aren't they? You get the original hardware, yeah. the original controller, yeah. playing it like you remember as a kid, but you don't need to go out and spend, like, 200 quid on an ultra-rare game. Instead, you can download them off the internet, put them in top of an, in an SD card, in the top of a cartridge, plug them into your system, and it's like, it's not emulation, it, you're actually playing the game on the original Yeah, hardware. and they run pretty smooth as well, don't they? As good as the originals, yeah. yeah, really good. And I've got them for like my N64, my Super Nintendo, my Mega Drive, pretty much all my cartridge-based yeah. systems I've got one for, apart from my Jaguar. The thing about the Jag is, there's not a lot of games on the system. And they're pretty rare, aren't they? Yeah. because so like 60, isn't there, or something like yeah, that? Yeah, I think it's yeah, maybe 50, even less than that. Maybe 49, I want to say. 49, the top is it? Yeah, so not many. <laughs> Offici- these were when it, when it was actually on sale. I mean, there's yeah. been more released you know, yeah. in the interim years. Um, and I think there's 13 on the CD unit. So not a big <laughs> catalogue. I've probably got most of them, to be fair. Yeah. But there are a few that I know are out of my reach and I'll never be able to get hold of. But I'd like to play them. So now we've finally got an Atari Jaguar SD card adapter. Now, this is from Retro HQ, and it allows you to play about the full catalogue of Atari Jaguar games, and what's also equally as exciting is homebrew games as well. Well, also, it allows you to play bin files as well, which I assume are the Jaguar CD ones, but it also says... uh, it can be installed in an Atari Jaguar without the actual CD adapter, so maybe you can play CD games without having to use the adapter. Apparently it doesn't work with the 
CD adapter from what I've read in the forums, which is going to be a bit of a pain for me because I'll have to take it off, but, you know, small price to pay. A bit weird that it doesn't, though, because it's meant to be a pass-through, but we'll see. Um, they're also going to include some stuff on here as well that you can download on this website. That Bad Apple demo that oh, I yeah. love. Oh, yeah, the famous one. There's a 14 megabyte Atari Jaguar version of that that obviously not many people have been able to experience until now. You've finally been able to play that. Um, there's also reboot game packs as well, a lot of freeware games that they've released too. So really, it is a way to get every single Atari Jaguar commercial releases. Um, a lot of the prototypes have been le- released online now, games that were like in development but never got finished. I guess that's pretty cool. Yeah. And uh, we'll talk about the price here as well because... Everdrives are very expensive yeah. items. This is £140, but if you think of getting probably a single title for the Jaguar... I was, I was literally you know. about to say, you know, they can be quite expensive, these uh, Everdrives, but £140 for the Jaguar, Jaguar one... You know, that's two Jaguar games. I bought Atari carts for 160 quid last well, year. Well, there you so go. Yeah. <laughs> but the real question I've got for you, Dan, is once you get this... Are you going to sell your collection? Because you've pretty much sold off all your other guns, haven't yeah. you? Yeah. I mean, I'm probably not too far away, you know? Like I said, I think it's about Atari sale! <laughs> <laughs> you've got an almost complete collection, haven't you? I'm probably maybe about seven games away from it. Yeah. Probably not, because I've never had a complete collection for any system before. Yeah. And the Jag does kind of seem like the most attainable one. When I get over these kind of... Cause, I mean, Rayman is actually a... And one of the biggest games I'm missing in my collection, but I've been chatting to a friend of mine today who's just got me a copy of it. So oh, really? Fill that gap there. Well, you used to always be like, I'm not paying over £100 for yeah. bloody Ray, man. <laughs> Annoyingly, because I could have got it like, you know, eight years ago, probably for 20, 30 quid. Ugh. But now it's because of YouTubers and eBay prices and all that. But yeah, I've sourced one this morning. So I've got all the big games now. That was the major missing point in my collection but yeah I, I don't think I'm going to sell them though because it's, it's probably the only system I'll ever get close to a well, complete collection you know where I am if you do want to sell them <laughs> and, and the Jaguar yeah yes. and the CD add-on yes yeah. remortgage your house Joe <laughs> maybe maybe <laughs> it's watching like 10 years everyone be like oh, on the car boot sale for a fiver yeah, yeah probably <laughs> now <laughs> oh, my luck so yeah it, it is good news that there is finally an Atari Jaguar flash cut out there so I remember people were asking Crick's the guy behind the Everdrive and he was like, oh, there's not a big enough market for it. He didn't want to do it. Mm. But apparently they've already sold about 400 of these. It oh, was. Really? First day. It yeah. was oh, wow. needed, yeah. yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So definitely worth getting hold of if you're a Jag fan. Now, Ion Fury. Now, this has been everywhere. I was reading about this in the Metro the other day. Yeah, so Iron Fury is a game that's a collaboration, basically, between 3D Realms, who were the guys who originally did Duke Nukem 3D. Um, You know, we had Scott Miller on the show, and he kind of talked about it. They also did Shadow Warrior and all that. That was using Ken Silverman's build engine. Well, they've worked with a group of modders, uh, ex-modders, called Voidpoint, and they've created this new title, Iron Fury. It was actually originally going to be called Iron Maiden. I heard about until that. Until Iron Maiden <laughs> threatened to sue them. Yeah, imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the wrong guys to pick on. But it looks really exciting and interesting game. Uh, it's kind of got that mid-90s feel, and being built on the build engine, it's... It's a kind of brand new title as well, but um, this isn't new FPS game though. Yeah, but it's in it's in the two point five D style that you used to get. Um, I think it's like the most beautiful looking version of a, if you will, a Doom clone yeah. kind of game. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. We've also actually got the original voice actor. I think his name is it like John Saint John or something who did Duke Nukem's voice. Is the actual the voice of the bad guy in this game as well, which I think is really fun. <laughs> Because you're watching LGR's video about it. Yeah, I was watching yeah. LGR's video the other day, and it does look really, really interesting. But um, so far, I think it's... I was just seeing it on the PC, but I am looking to get it on Xbox One, but I don't think there's been a physical release for it on console. Okay. And it's had a I little bit of uh, uh, kind of keeping to its old school roots um, problems where they've just had to issue apologies for transphobic and sexist comments right. in the game. So 3D Realms now have a zero tolerance policy going forward. <laughs> so it really is... Uh, a 90s game. Yeah. <laughs> in, in more ways than one. Yeah. I mean, I, I do love that kind of era of FPS games. Yeah. And we talked about it on the show before, that it was such an innovative time, and every new one that came out, it'd be like, you'd never seen that in a game before, you know, that really pushed the limits of what those games could do. And I think now it's kind of got to the stage where I am weirdly nostalgic for that era of FPS games, even though often playing a lot of the originals kind of <laughs> sends me a bit wobbly after like 10 minutes of play them. <laughs> and when we talked to Scott, he was obviously like in a kind of bad way about Duke Nukem forever. Yeah. 
So it's good to see 3D Realms having a successful title coming out after the absolute mess that was Duke Nukem yeah, Forever. We can just forget about that now, yeah. can't we? Yeah. <laughs> now, playing retro games is all well and good. We all love playing it on the original hardware. You need a good screen as well, don't you, to play your retro games on. Preferably something that you played it on when you were a kid. A nice old school CRT. That's what you need. <laughs> now, this is a story on ABC7 News in Virginia. Right. Have a listen to this. But one Virginia neighborhood has been left puzzled after a prankster left dozens of old TV sets on people's front porches. Take a look at the bizarre video. That person is wearing a TV set while dropping <laughs> off the old sets and then walking off. Pretty bizarre. Outdated boxes were found in front of more than 50 homes. Local police say it appears to be nothing more than a prank, but that the only crime committed here is illegal dumping. <laughs> so this That's is a brilliant. guy who's been caught on people's home security systems with a CRT TV on his head. Well, it's like a cardboard CRTV that he's got on his head and then he's got a kind of overalls of like a, a worker but he looks like he's a CRT man he's kind of <laughs> <laughs> like a ro you, if you saw that you'd crap yourself if you saw something like that <laughs> middle of the night just guy walking delivering old <laughs> technology you know what I think it is because a lot of people in America have these absolute huge collections warehouses all of this I think he's probably just not been able to dump it anywhere <laughs> and they've said right let's just drive around the neighbourhood and give everybody a free TV. <laughs> but it's such a random thing to do. I mean, they're obviously, like, they're he's proper making They're proper old school CRTs yeah. as well, aren't they? Like proper 70s like. Well, so why, actually... why is he not coming around here? I need a CRT. <laughs> I love a visit from the CRT centre. <laughs> I need a CRT TV. He needs to come over to the UK. Well, actually, you said it's all really old ones. Actually, some of them he's been leaving on there are like late 90s, early 2000s, oh, really? Trinitrons and stuff. Oh, what? And Trinitrons? You, you watch these news reports and there's pictures of them loading them up to go and dump them. And I'm watching those and I'm like, oh, I'd have had that TV, it's like it is a bit heartbreaking watching it. It's a weird thing, isn't it? Do you think we're gonna get like guys going around putting vinyls in things <laughs> or, or, or old technology? Well, what I've seen on um, if, this is left on our Facebook page actually. I apologize, I can't remember who put it on there. This guy said he thinks it may be a group of chip tune artists, okay. and he's linked us to a page here, um, Chip Bit Day, they're called, and they're a chip tune group who wear CRT monitors on their head when right. they perform uh -huh. and he didn't know if it was some kind of publicity stunt for them I've never heard of them before but I've done a bit of digging today turns out they're based in Manchester though so they're uh, yeah. all the way to Virginia it's yeah. but also if it was a thing you'd kind of film yourself doing it you wouldn't get caught on a video doorbell you know that's the weird thing about it he's, he's not trying to get caught he's just wants to deliver CRTs. Yeah. He just wants everybody to play for um, light gun shooters again. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> See, next, he might be delivering like N64s next week as yeah, well. Yeah, can you imagine? Summer. And this guy's a legend. Get him around. We need more of that in the world, don't yeah. we? Yeah. Right then, before we get into our chat with Steve Jarrod talking about legendary video games magazines, speaking of incredible publications, let's give a huge thank you to our loyal supporter, big fans of the Retro Hour podcast. This is The Economist. Now, The Economist are a really trustworthy publication. Over 170 years of history here in Britain. And it means they've got a broad range of subjects. There really is something for everyone in The Economist, covering stuff like world politics, business, science. We love their technology articles as well and the video game stuff they cover. And every week on the show, we have a look at The Economist and pick out something that we found really interesting over the last week or two. Yeah, so I, I found a piece here which is about um, a brain-machine interface, which is basically Elon Musk is looking at um, doing deep brain stimulation to get people working with electrodes within their brain and that kind of controlling computers and stuff. And I was thinking about some of the brain-controlled mind devices that we had in the 90s. Do you these, remember these that These are stuff? a thing. These were a thing back in the day and still are. So these, I mean, it sounds like something out of science fiction, doesn't it? Yeah, so there was there was one called the Mind Drive, which was a thought-controlled device. And uh, there's an actual video from uh, Lazy Game Reviews. And you can control DOS PC games <laughs> with your brainwaves. It doesn't seem to work that efficiently. <laughs> so maybe Elon Musk is going to come up with uh, the new Mind Drive... <laughs> It is cool the economists do cover this kind of thing, though. I mean, it, a lot of the stuff you read in there, it just gives you kind of a new view on stuff. You're like, I didn't know about that. You learn a lot reading the economists. Now, we'd actually like to give you 
your own free copy of The Economist through your door. <laughs> so if you live in the UK and you want to get a copy, it'll drop through your letterbox onto your mat. All you have to do is text the word retro and send it to 78070. And of course, you'll be really helping out the podcast for doing it. You'll get a copy through your door completely free. All you have to do is text retro and send that to 78070 with The Economist, the smart guide to the forces changing your world. Right, let's talk about incredible publications. The magazines that we grew up reading back in the day with this week's special guest, Steve Jarrett. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast and it's time to welcome on this week's very special guest. Now, the chap we're going to be talking to today is a games publishing veteran. Been involved in just pretty much every magazine we used to read as kids and teenagers. Stuff like official PlayStation magazine, official Sega magazine, Edge, Amiga format, Crash, Zap, so many. So it's a pleasure to welcome to the podcast... Steve Jarrett, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. Now, before we get into your time working on those legendary titles, I mean, just to kind of get a bit of a background on you, I mean, what's kind of your your earliest memory of video games? Do you remember kind of where it started for you? Oh, absolutely, yeah. It was it was bizarre, really. I, as you can probably tell from the accent, I'm from the West Midlands. Yeah. Uh, Mum and Dad were great fans of Scotland, and me and my brother uh, got dragged up there on a number of occasions. And it was really odd. We found ourselves in a hotel in the sort of, literally in the middle of nowhere, you know, so just outside the window. My vague recollection is just fields of sort of bracken and heather with mountains off in the distance. And anyway, we we were sort of mooching around the big, the, the, the big bar area, the downstairs of this hotel. And they had, um, it wasn't the Pong machine, but it was a Pong machine. Yeah, so obviously seeing this, this early Pong machine was... Um, quite an eye-opener for me and so the next step uh, was to get one of the uh, tv games of the, of the day which is what they used to be they used to be called they were basically sort of dedicated consoles um well they weren't really consoles they were just games machines and they had mine was a one uh, it was a printronic deluxe 2 i think oh well remembered <laughs> mm, yeah well i've 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 because of the, the beauty of the internet is because I'd forgotten it for many years, but now you can find pictures of it, and it was a big sort of shiny, um, like a slab of cheese-shaped machine with a big black dial where you, you could select any of the six games. And it came with a light gun as well. So it had sort of the typical Pong and then football, which I think was two bats, and then the like skeet shooting and, and that kind of thing. Um and then, so they played that for a while, and then there was a there was a big gap until a friend. Well, I, I, friends had got ZX eighty ones and then ZX Spectrums, um, and then uh, so I spent an evening with a friend playing on the ZX Spectrum, and that was it. Then I, I knew that that was certainly where my interest would lie. I did I didn't at that point know that that would where that was where my career would lie. Did you have a passion for kind of writing and journalism as a kid? Did you want to be a reporter? No, <laughs> no, lied, lied on the CV, lied on the job application. Uh, I mean, the most I'd ever done, I, I mean, I had a, because uh, I'd, I'd obviously had the Commodore 64 for a couple of years before the Zap job, maybe even just 18 months, actually. Uh, and I'd got a, I bought a five and a quarter inch floppy drive and I'd got a dot matrix printer and I'd sort of fiddled around on that. But that was, that was as much as I'd ever done. You know, I, I didn't I didn't study English particularly. I didn't do a fanzine as a kid. You know, I had no real interest in being a journalist. Uh, so I just fell into it, really. Well, was Zap the first mag you worked on? And how, how did you end up there? Uh, yeah, I, I was a massive fan of the magazine. Well, I was. A, I mean, it was just that virtuous circle of going, I loved the Commodore 64. Um and I really enjoyed Zap magazine, and it was just one of those things. It was just a, I mean, Zap was basically an enabler for me to go and spend my money. So I'd get the magazine on a Thursday or Friday, sort of read it over the read it the, over, overnight, and then on Saturday morning, having decided what to buy, I'd trundle up the shops and hopefully find the games that they'd be talking about. And I had it for I don't know, maybe best part of a year, I guess. And then Gary Lydon, one of the writers on it, was leaving. And they had a little news article saying, you know, do you want to come and join the team? And I, I genuinely thought, oh, that'd be brilliant to go along and see where they work and stuff. So I'll apply and hopefully they'll just invite me down so I can go and see the offices and meet Jazz and Gaz and all the team. Uh, 
with no real intention of getting the job. So I just I just wrote off and then nothing happened. I just I've forgotten all forgotten all about it. They, then they got me down for an interview, and it transpired that somebody had been offered a job and I think didn't take it or turned up and was rubbish. So the second guy uh, turned them down, I think. And so yeah, I was third on the list. <laughs> so um, I mean, lucky for me that the other two didn't work out. Uh, yeah, so I, I went down and. It was not a it was not a simple case of me just going yes this is the best thing ever I'll take it because I was working in industry at the time in the West Midlands I was still living up with my mum and dad and it was a big thing for me because I had to move it, like it was an hour away it wasn't commutable because um, it's also a diff, you know it's a difficult uh, journey from the West Midlands across through countryside past tractors and stuff to get to Ludlow, which is in it's a Welsh border country. And so I, I did sort of kind of go, oh, blimey, what do I do about this? Because it sounds really interesting. And fortunately, I was, it was just about to be made redundant from the job that I was working, which is a, a chemical company in the West Midlands, which sort of made my mind, mind up. So I went, okay, well, I, I, I'm very shortly about to not have a job. Um, I better take it. So I, uh, I up sticks and moved to Ludlow. And I worked on Zap for about 18 months. Well, Zap was published by Newsfield. And I remember they were like, they're quite a big player in, especially in the games magazines back in the 80s. Um, mm. What was it like working there then? Was it a fun place to be? Oh, it was brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, it, it's, 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 it breaks my heart a little bit because it, little did I know it would never get better than that. The 18 months I spent there was just a joy. Uh, crazy, stupid times. I mean, it was basically an office with a few. Um, kind of adults who were running the place and then just a bunch of kids running riot and making stuff up and, and you know, just make, sort of making the job as we went along. But, do, you know, doing an okay, an okay job of getting magazines out and writing decent copy and having fun. But it was just, it was just organised chaos and I absolutely loved it. So you were doing reviews at first. What would you look for when you were scoring a game and how long did it take you to get to doing a full review then? Did you have to play it for days or...? I've thought about this quite a lot recently, actually, because uh, back in those halcyon days, uh, you could probably see the bulk of a game in an afternoon. It was very rare that we had a game where we where we couldn't get a, a grasp of the mechanics and the playability, for want of a better word. Uh, whereas now, obviously, you put somebody in front of No Man's Sky and go, go on, then knock out a review in four hours. You, you, you've got absolutely no chance. Most of the big budget games these days, it must be so hard to come to um, a, a sort of a critical judgment of something when you've got so little. You've basically got 99.999% of the game still to play after the first day. So we were quite fortunate in as much as you know, very often I do two reviews in a day. I do one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And I still stand by them. I don't think we we skimmed at all. If there was a game that felt like it was more complicated or there was more to come, if it was a multi-stage game where we wanted to get through it to, to, you know, to see later things, then we'd do that. But, you know, when you... <laughs> I think the first game I ever reviewed was BMX Bandits. You know, after an hour, you know if that's... You know exactly what it, what it is, and you know if it's any good or not. Yeah. And that was the case with many games on on the Commodore 64. So it was it was fortunate really that we could um, we could get through them because actually, I mean, back in those days, you know, they were releasing games at a huge rate of knots. You know, we would very often have sort of 20, 30 games in an issue. Whereas I've just wandered down to town today to trade in a bunch of games, and I've got I've got nothing to play now. I'm waiting for something to turn up. I think my next game will be the next Gears of War, uh, which is like toward the tail end of September. Mm. It's been a really lean year for games. But back then, my God, we were just inundated with the damn things. Well, were you getting all these games for free and were they kind of putting anything in there to make you write a better review as well? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I can absolutely, absolutely categorically say that, that we, we never got any. I mean, the only... I don't want to use the word bribes because as soon as you do, somebody will jump on it. I mean, they would come down and they would take us for lunch or we'd go out for drinks in the evening. But they were PR people. That's just what that's just what their job was. But because it wasn't such a big – the stakes weren't as high back then. Uh, so they would come down, they would bring the release code, 
I mean, pretty much 99% of the time, the, the, the games were absolutely finished. You know, they, they were kind of gold master releases that we, the, the code that we had was perfectly playable, was fine, it was finished. And we just reviewed them and sometimes games got, um, you know, panned and generally they just had to live with it. And I think back in those days, people were pretty honest. They kind of knew deep down if games weren't that great. And so we very rarely had any issue with any of the PR people, any of the publishers and developers. Whereas sort of later on, of course, if somebody rocks up with Ubisoft's latest 30 hour, took 300 people five years to make, it's a different kettle of fish. Yeah, I guess but, on, the, yeah, on the 64 it, days when they're paying some bedroom coder like maybe five grand yeah. to make a game, it was a different, yeah, different era, wasn't it? Yeah, very much so. And it was uh, it, there were there were simpler times, uh, way less complicated, and also way less um, way less fractious and difficult in terms of dealing with PRs. Whereas, whereas you know some of the big companies nowadays, um, it's like dealing with Disney or you know Lucasfilm or whatever. It's just it's painful. So. Um, yeah, it was much easier back in those days. But all the yeah, we I mean obviously we had all the code for free, but you know, it didn't matter cuz I, I still bought games and cuz they were between 2 quid and 10 quid a pop. So, it, you know, you could buy as many as you like, to be honest. So after that, you became editor for Crash. Now, I mean, obviously, we kind of had the, the fraction I remember at school, you know, Spectrum versus Commodore 64. I mean, how did it kind of differ working on a Spectrum magazine to the 64 then? Did you notice much of a difference? Oh, yeah. Uh, in terms of the production of the magazine, it was very similar to, to Zap, because obviously Zap was a spin-off of Crash. Crash was the first magazine that Newsfield set up, which started as a, a mail-order catalogue. And then started to include editorial, and then it just took off as a, as a magazine. And it was very similarly structured to, well, so rather, Zap was very similarly structured to Crash. So basically, the editor left. I'd been doing sort of all right on Zap. I think they, you know, they thought I was a pretty solid guy and I could just get the job done. So they offered me the role. Uh, obviously, my heart of hearts. I didn't want to work on a Spectrum magazine because I was a I was a C64 guy. I would much rather have edited Zap, to be honest. But you know, you don't turn down the opportunity to edit at the time. It was the, still the biggest games magazine in in the in the UK, I think. But I didn't do it for very long, uh, and I wasn't very good at it, if I'm honest. I just kind of filled the gaps left by the last person, and kind of I just worked to the the schedule that was already up and running. But I, I managed to get it out without breaking them too badly. I don't think. Well, Newsfield also had their own games publishing label, so that was Falamus. Um, how did the relationship work with the magazine? I think they were fortunate that pretty much all of Falamus's games were great. Sort of, so from on the one hand, as a reader, you might go, "Yeah, well, of course you're going to rate Falamus game highly because you know you're part of the same company." But the truth was, it was easy to give them good reviews because they were they were great games. You know, they were they were all. To my knowledge, they were all 85%, 90% plus games. So it worked out pretty well. It's a real shame they didn't continue with it because they had a really good catalogue of titles. But I think that when they came to the when the 8-bit era came to an end, I don't think they know what didn't know what to do with it particularly. And it's I think there were poss- possibly other financial things that were going on that I wasn't party to. So. Yeah, because in our new field, it kind of wound up, didn't it, in the early 90s? I mean, yeah, was, was yeah. it a company that was think, always a bit on they, the edge or...? Yeah, if, you know, I think back in those days, I think most game publishers were. You know, I mean, there were, there were, there were only a handful of the really big ones that had um, like a real sense of heritage and traction and you knew would carry on. So many games developers and, and publishers, you know, fell by the wayside, especially with that very tricky move from 8-bit to 16-bit uh, and then sort of beyond that as well. I think the move to Amiga caught a lot of people out. And then, of course, the market got the market began to get quite fractured around that time as well. When we started to see more of the 8-bit consoles as well, and you know that that caught a lot of people out. A lot of publishers wanted to work on Nintendo and Sega, and that you know that caught them out. They couldn't make the transition to console um, publishing as easily as you could with just cassettes and discs. Well, you left Newsfield and went to work for EMAP, and you were at another system, which was a Commodore user this time. Yeah, yeah, that was, um, I was offered a, well, I I sort of left Newsfield 
under strange circumstances, which I won't go into. Um, and I was kind of left out on the left in the lurch a little bit. And fortunately, somebody offered me a role on the magazine in London. But I knew I didn't want to move to London at that point in my life. The move to Ludlow was bad enough. So you can imagine me going, oh, yeah, the what, moving to the smoke didn't really appeal very much. So I commuted from the West Midlands to, to London for a couple of months. Uh, and fortunately, uh, Graham Kidd, who was a great editor, he used to edit Crash for a long time. He'd moved down to Future Publishing and he headhunted me and offered me a job down there, which I very gladly took. So you get the train every day then, were you? Or? Yeah, wow. it was really, it was, don't get me wrong, it was really stupid. And I used to get up really early, grab some breakfast, jump in the car, drive down to Sandal and Dudley, jump on the train, get off at, oh, God, what's the station called? Uh, Euston mm. thing, Euston thingy, anyway, and, I'd get, and then I'd get the tube over to um, Farringdon and walk around the corner. So it was, just, it was just a stupidly long journey every day. And I think I managed to put up with it for about four months or something. I'd, I'd literally wake up on the train not knowing where the hell I was. Um, so yeah, I'm glad it. I'm glad it ended when it did. <laughs> well, how did you find working at EMAP after Newsfield? I mean, did it seem like a, a lot more corporate? It was rubbish. Hmm. It was absolutely awful because we got there and it was it was very spacious and very kind of well appointed and quite professional. And yeah, they put you at a great big desk with a typewriter. So uh, we'd all been working with Amstrad CPC. Not this is CPC. The little Amstrad all-in-one green screen computers and also Apricot. Um, so desktop machines uh, and so to go back to, to, to go to a typewriter which I'd never used you, you, you can imagine you've got no you've got no undo function you've got no delete key you know you've got no way of saving your files it's all on paper with red pen for markings and then tipex for your mistakes and it was just dreadful yeah, it, it must have it felt was, like going um, back to the stone age did it <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah honestly it just felt like I'm sure proper journalists would go, well, that's that's how you should you know, work your way up, you know, you know, learn to use a typewriter and get all those skills down pat. But when you've been using a word processor, it just felt such a retrograde step to go to, you know, clattering on keys and have, hang, handing pieces of paper to people, which then came back with red marks on and it's, oh, it's just, ugh. it was grim. And I didn't really enjoy my time there, to, to be honest. Especially when, like, some of the... Features in the magazines, I guess, were about how great word processors were and how we should all be using them. And they're written yeah, well, that's, yeah, all the written Yeah, the, 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 well, the, of course, the irony is you're surrounded, you're surrounded by computers. Yeah. You know, because you had, uh, I think, at the, probably about that time, you at least got, at the very least, you'd got um, CVG uh, and either Commodore and a Specchia Mag and poss possibly an Amiga magazine back at that. So everybody was using computers to play games on, and yet we'd write about them on these on these archaic 100-year-old devices. <laughs> Crazy times. Well, after Remap, you started what would be a, a long career at Future Publishing. Now, they, uh, at the time, they kind of seemed like, you know, the new, new kids on the block, you know, coming around and going to stir things up. And initially, it was an Ace magazine, which was a multi-format mag. I mean, did that have its challenges working on a multi-format magazine and maintaining a balance between the systems that you covered? I don't remember it being a particular issue because it was a, it was a fairly, it was a decent sized team. Uh, and again, there were, you know, we'd gone through the period where there were quite a lot of games coming out. So I kind of guess, if anything, we had to pick and choose which games to review. But that was, that's relatively easy. You know, you, you just pick the ones with the biggest names or the ones that look like the most interesting. Or and, and you did at least try and keep a balance. You know, we tried to keep some 8-bit stuff in there as well as deal with PC and 16-bit and consoles and whatever, which is quite nice, actually, you know, because on a, sometimes on single-format magazines, you're forced to review, like, everything, including the, you know, the oceans of dross that turn up. So at least we could be a little bit more selective on Ace. But Ace was a great magazine. It was really nice. And it was a big mag as well. We had plenty of pages to, to fill. So, uh, yeah, I, I never saw it as much of a problem, to be honest. Well, did you see the increasing popularity of consoles at the time? Yeah, I mean, my, oh, my memory of it is a bit fuzzy now. The first time I came across an NES was uh, on Zap. They had one in the office. Because it's, I mean, because it's really weird. Because you, we sort of vaguely forget that it, it had been big business in America for years before we got it. You know, you had, you had the, the gaming crash in America, which was sort of eighty two, eighty three, and then, but very quickly after that, the NES came along and sort of saved the whole market. 
Uh, I can't remember what it was. I think it was about 84, 85 when I joined Zap. So we, we were quite early, early in getting an, e, an NES in the office to play with. But they didn't really appear on, on the high street for, you know, maybe a year or two after that in any great number. But, um, yeah, I mean, I was, I was certainly aware that I was starting to kind of fall in love with console uh, console games, especially from Japan as well. You know, these machines just look really impressive. And there was something very solid and very innovative about the games coming out of the, the, the Far East as well. Yeah, I think they played more like arcade games. And that was always a goal back then, wasn't it, to kind of try and replicate that arcade experience at home? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, for, for years that was that was the holy grail. You know, you, you wanted, if it, wasn't an, if it wasn't an arcade, a perfect conversion, you wanted it to be you know if the game didn't feel like an arcade game they very much wanted it to be i think i think that's i think that's fair enough to say i mean there was still an awful lot of innovation on the 8 and 16 bit computers you know we were very lucky in this country cuz admittedly the games were really slick and polished on the consoles but they were all very samey as well there were lots of just lots and lots of platformers uh, whereas we got all sorts of things, you know, we were getting games like Elite and Mercenary and Sentinel, and you know the 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 the, the driller games, lots of you know get, going into. I mean, we were doing 3D way before the Japanese mm. and, and and other developers, other foreign developers were doing that kind of stuff. So it was uh, it, it was really fascinating times, you know. You, to, there was innovation and quality all all over the place, you know, back then. I guess as it got bigger, it kind of became a bit more safer, didn't it? You know, when there's big budgets involved. Yeah, it's exactly right. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, look at the state of play today. Like I say, I'm, I'm bemoaning the fact that I just handed in uh, Assassin's Creed Origins, um, or I should say traded in Assassin's Creed Origins and uh, Spider-Man and something, well, an old Battlefield game. And it's been, it's been very little this year that I've really wanted to play after those games, which is a real shame. It does feel like the market has got very safe. And like things like um, Horizon Zero Dawn, which I absolutely adored, they just and, and also Spider Man. I guess it, it, you know they 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 feel like they're cut from the same cloth. They feel really few and far between those games at the moment. Well, Future launched the first official Sega Mag in the UK, and you were the editor. So, what was the story behind the launch and the concept of S the Sega Mag? Yeah, what what a dreadful magazine that was. <laughs> um, not my not, not my proudest achievement, I have to say. Basically, Sega were looking for, again, my knowledge of this, you could probably just go on Wikipedia and find all this stuff far more accurately. But my, my memory of it is that uh, Sega wanted to launch the machine over here, but they wanted to do it in partnership with somebody. And I think they did it with Virgin, which was... Mastertronic, sure wasn't it? I, I think it, was, yeah. think it might have been Virgin Mastertronic at the time. Uh, and we'd got a really close relationship with, um, with Virgin and also the guy that was running the company. And I think I think they came to Future and said we want to do uh, a pack-in magazine with the console. I think because we'd had great success with Commodore Format, which had been bundled with the Amiga, the Amiga machine, mm -hmm. and just did great business. It did. It was great for Commodore and it was great for for us uh, at Future. And I think it was something along those lines. Anyway, it was. Um, it felt sort of like a glorified fanzine or because it was because at the first it was subscription only i think to my knowledge i don't think the first ones were sold on the newsstand i might be wrong but um yeah we i was asked to do it and, and i did and it was okay well what was the relationship with sega like were they really supportive of the mag or did they just kind of abandon it <sighs> god um i remember that i was forced to use tony takushi's column which was always dreadful. Sorry, Tony, but it, it <laughs> genuinely was. Um, and then, I mean, they, yeah, I mean, they delivered games for us to review, but that was, I think that was about it. I think, I mean, it was, you know, I think it was financially backed with a few adverts. Um, but it, yeah, because it wasn't really Sega, it was coming through Virgin. I think, I think they just saw it as a useful marketing tool, but not much more than that, I don't think. But like I say, it's such a long time ago now. I've the very vague recollections of doing the thing. I mean, it was the fact that a lot of the games were developed, you know, in Japan and America. I mean, that must have been a bit more of a, a challenge than when they were just down the road, like a publisher. Yeah, I mean, we we occasionally we had to just go and get retail copies, or they or they provided us with retail copies. But very often you'd just get. I mean, the thing is, people sort of forget that developing on cartridge, much as it's 
the end product is very different, it's still the very same very similar principle in as much as that they have uh, instead of burning it to disk they burn it to uh, these kind of development cartridges which are kind of I think they're kind of you know re- read often type devices and they would they would just bring down these sort of little PCBs that you'd slot into a, ma- a master system and just play the game all the code was there all complete it just wasn't in a nice little cartridge box that was all did you end up going to any memorable gaming events or expos kind of back in that golden age no. No. <laughs> no, just stayed in the office, getting the magazine out. I went to some game shows when I was at Newsfield, and we went to some some game shows when I was at, in the early days of Future, and then when Future itself did one or two. But uh, not as many as you think, no. Yeah, I remember hearing stories about those, and the Indians, the industry dinners and stuff, they apparently were at some quite good after parties. Yeah, I only ever went to one. Yeah, right. uh, I, I, I believe I went to one because they gave me an award. Otherwise, otherwise, I wouldn't have got an invite. <laughs> well, I mean, the home computer scene in Britain was still big. And then Future did something quite surprising in 1990. You touched on it before. Um, a Commodore magazine launched dedicated to the Commodore 64 in 1990 with Commodore Format. I mean, after working on the Sega mag and then going to that, I mean, did that kind of feel a bit like a step back almost, going back to the, the 8-bit machine? I think I'd had enough of the, the, the Sega magazine because I'd done, you know, quite a few issues, um, and it was I kind of I kind of guess at first I kind of went, why are you doing this? And then they sat me in, in, in an office and explained, and they went, you know, they said, look, this is the Commodore 64 is still doing big business. Commodore was about to bring out the 64 GS, which was their their idea of a console version of the computer, um, which obviously failed miserably, but they were still shifting units and people were still selling games, and I think a lot of people had sort of piled into the 16-bit market and weren't really prepared for it and weren't doing very well. And quite a few people had gone, you know what, the C64, there are still millions of units out there. We're still making good money, so let's just carry on with it. And, I, you know, I, I kind of figured, well, there's, there's at least, you know, if your future thinks it's, it's, um, it has enough potential to, to back a magazine, um, uh, you know, in, and keep it going for a, a year, eighteen months, and that'll be, you know, that's mean a job for eighteen months. It's fine. So uh, I took it because it, it, and it also was a, a nice opportunity to go back to my heartland, which was the C64. I mean, I was actually looking at the um, the first issue of Commodore Format Online before, and I love the fact that the the first cover stories were the, like you said, the Commodore 64 GS. And the uh, CD TV as well, which obviously were two of the the biggest flops of the era. I mean, mm. what what did you think of those systems? I mean, did did you think they'd be successful or? Um, I didn't. I didn't really have much of an opinion on the CD TV, to be honest. Um, Ahead of its time, probably. I think. Yeah, yeah, it, it definitely was. I mean, the, the the GS felt like an okay idea, but just too late, I think. Hmm. And also, it was, it was just very horribly a Commodore 64 without a keyboard. You know, they hadn't really redesigned the, the in my, my recollection of it being quite a long, thin thing that took cartridges. It was, it just felt like the, the, the wrong machine at the wrong time because you're asking people right toward the end of the 8-bit era, you're asking people to, to invest in manufacturing cartridges, which is really expensive. But actually what you want to do is shove them on disc and cassettes because it's way cheaper. Well, so, yeah, it was, a, it, it was a good idea, but it was just too late i know you left after a year but the magazine actually ran till 1995 which was when the playstation was out um that's mm. quite an achievement isn't it yeah i would like to think it was a good magazine i, th- I think it's probably one of the better magazines I've, I've i've devised and worked on obviously a lot of the credit goes to the, the team especially andy dyer that i work with um who made it a really really funny magazine and and a, and a fun place to be to work on, and I think we we worked well together. So it was a, it was good times, you know. I mean, it, much as you might go, oh my god, you know, you're working on an eight bit magazine. When you you know when I got home, I was playing on a uh, god. I mean, I'd been playing on the on the Atari ST mm. since I'd been at Newsfield. So probably back then, I don't know what I was using, but I certainly wasn't playing on the Commodore 64 when I got home. Um, so you get the best of both worlds, really. Well, that mag's still got quite a following. Our friend Neil, I know he runs the uh, the Commodore Format website. There's a couple mm. of interviews with you on there as well. So it's yeah. uh, obviously made an impression when it came out. Yeah, I, th- I think of uh, possibly apart from Edge, mm. uh, I think Commodore 64 has got has had the most impact uh, with people, and as all and also I think people are sort of most loyal to, which is really nice. It's really nice that something you create is still highly thought of long after it's shuffled off. 
Well, he went back to Consoles after that in another groundbreaking magazine, uh, Total. Now, am I right in thinking that was the first official Nintendo mag in the UK? Uh, yeah, certainly in the UK, possibly in Europe. Uh, I think in Japan, obviously, and America, they had a f- sort of more official uh, Nintendo magazines. Yeah, Nintendo, Nintendo Power Nintendo, and stuff. Yeah. yeah, Nintendo Power is a bit of a weird one because that's yeah, that felt like it was actually sort of backed and you know financed by Nintendo. Hmm. Well, it felt like it anyway, if, even if it wasn't. So yeah, it was um, obviously Future had seen the rise of the Nintendo and, and wanted a part of it because actually at the time, you know, you, you look back at the portfolio, we got magazines for everything else. So that was the one that was missing. And Total had a very good kind of tongue-in-cheek and funny style uh, that came out. Uh, Was that like a targeted decision to create that personality for the magazine? Well, I I mean, a lot of it stemmed from the fact that it was me and Andy. Um, They came to us after our tenure on on Commodore Format and said, do you want to launch a Nintendo magazine? Which obviously I'd I'd leet at the chance because by then I I think I was pretty much a fully-fledged Nintendo fan. I remember, because I remember Graham Kidd bought me a Game Boy back from Japan when I was an, on Ace, which I loved. And I'd played a little bit of NES, but I think by that time we were kind of into, yeah, because I'm pretty sure that when I was on Commodore format, that's when I first saw the Super Nintendo. And I bought an import unit, a Japanese import machine, and just adored it. So I was I was a proper Nintendo fanboy by by that stage so to do a magazine about it was brilliant yeah it was just great uh, and we just took a lot of um, we took a lot of the influences from Commodore Format Commodore Format was in turn influenced by the Spectrum magazines hmm. which had got which were really funny and witty and cynical and, and um, very sort of British in their humour and so we, we were inspired by that and then Commodore Format inspired us to do uh, Total. And Total, so, when it launched for me in you know, 1992, like you said, then the Super Nintendo was just kind of gearing up. So it must have been a very exciting time to be writing about Nintendo. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, it, it's a shame that the magazine was so bloody hard to do. We managed to, to design something that was just painfully complex to put together. And it was just, it, I mean, it was full of graphics and cartoons. And it, oh, it was, yeah, it was... Um, it was difficult. We put, we wanted to make it really jolly because obviously we were launching for the NES at the time. So we were aiming at a younger audience. So we had to bear that in mind when we made the magazine. And we came up with lots of ideas and elements and graphics, but it, it was just torturous to do. You know, we were really pushing the, the hardware of the day because um, Future was very much a, you know, a desktop publishing, uh, Mac-based um, using Quark Express and Photoshop and you know, Illustrator, and we were just we were just pushing these machines as hard as they could go, and it was it was quite tricky. And that, you know it was it was just very busy. We were trying to get news in from America. There were lots of games to review, so yeah, it was um, we worked quite hard to get Total out. Well, then you were the launch editor of Edge, and I remember when Edge came out, everybody was like, wow, this is a really cool, uh, stylish magazine. And it's still a game that's very much, re- uh, it's a game magazine that's very much respected today. Well, yeah, good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad. Um, it was a weird one. They, uh, I believe it was, it was certainly uh, the guys in charge. I can't remember if Chris Anderson was still there. It was certainly Greg Ingham. Um, just took me into an office and said, um, we sold Ace Magazine to EMAP. Uh, in fact, that was a, just as, a, as an aside. I, I'd only just joined Future Publishing, and I did about four issues of Ace before they, they sold it to EMAP, which is the company I just left in London, which was a bit of a blow, because um, obviously I quite like the magazine. Uh, and part of the deal, because we got, I believe Future got in the region of £1.2 million pounds for it, which was great, because it allowed them to, to, to launch a bunch of other magazines with that money. And the deal was that Future couldn't launch a multi-format competitor until a certain amount of time had passed. Anyway, turns out that time duly went. And they said, we're looking to do a, we want to, you know, the deal with Ace is finished. We can do a multi-format games magazine. What do you want to do? And it was really weird because I I was really into visual effects, movie special effects back then. And I used to buy a journal called Cinefix which was a beautiful magazine. It came out four times a year from an American publisher, and it was just really lovely. And it didn't do any magazine-y stuff. It just was just words and pictures. 
Um, but it was the it, I, I, even though I'd never worked on the film, I, it, it made you feel quite inclusive. Mm-hmm. It had lots of anecdotes and lots of detail about how you know the production process and and how these visual effects were put together. And that sort of inspired me to do a magazine that was a little bit more technically minded because by that time, which is 1993, I think, um, games were becoming incredibly complex things. You know, we'd got, we'd got stuff on CD-ROM. We were looking toward 32 and 64-bit machines. I mean, VR has also raised his head for the first time. So there were lots of really clever technical things. And also, it, it played to my interest in technology and visual effects because a lot of the stuff that people were doing in games they were starting to borrow techniques from the visual effects industry. Um, like, um, I think in issue one, I did a piece about microcosm. Yeah. Uh, and the opening sequence for that was rendered on silicon graphics machines. It looked like a movie, didn't it, on, on the CD? Yeah, film. yeah. It looked like a really, really badly rendered CG movie. Yeah. So, I mean... <laughs> My jaw dropped when I saw that for the first time. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, a lot. you know, they were shooting people with props, green screen, and then they were rendering backgrounds. Um and one of the guys who was involved in it now runs digital uh, DNEG, um, double negative down in London, no, big okay. VFX says. Um, so anyway, there were lots of lots of things all came together in my hair at this time, given the fact that I was older by, by then. The market felt like it was maturing. Games were getting really interesting. And it, I just felt, instead of just going, oh, this is really good. Look at the graphics and the sound and the playability. Maybe we can be a little bit more um, measured in our approach and a little bit, you know, dig a little bit deeper and do a little bit more how games are made as well as how they play. And that, and that's how Edge came about. It was a complete change in style from something like Total, obviously. I mean, it felt a lot more grown up. Did you think that kind of reflected gaming at the time? Did it feel like gaming was becoming a bit more of a, a grown up kind of activity than just being for like preteens? Yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of games were chasing the adult market as well. I mean, I can't, I can't, the one that springs to mind, it's a bad example, to be honest, but games like Night Trap for the Sega Mega CD, you know, they were definitely pushing the limits of what you can do with video games. Uh, and so I think, uh, you know, and, and of course, we notoriously re- reviewed Doom early in uh, early on in the life of Edge. So you, you were getting magazines, that, sorry, you were getting games that definitely weren't aimed at kids anymore. You know, these weren't, you know, cheery, colourful Nintendo games. They were quite hardcore um, shooting and killing with lots of blood and gore and guts. So, yeah, definitely the market was very much maturing. So I think the magazine felt right at that time. If I could go back now and redo it, it, would be, it would necessarily, wouldn't necessarily be very different because you, we were still talking about the same content. But I think the way I put the magazine together would be very different, knowing things I've learned you know, since then. Well, it wasn't just um, Xbox and PlayStation and Switch. You were covering many systems like the 3DO, the CD32, the Jaguar. Was it difficult to kind of know what console to back and support with so many on the market? No, again, not really. You know, we do, you know we've got 100 pages of editorial. You know, we do a magazine every four weeks. You know, everything. everything. Again, a little bit like Ace, we could pick and choose which was great because it meant that if something was interesting, you know, I think we did maybe one article and maybe a couple of previews and a review of, 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 a, of a CD TV game or the CD TV system. But, you know, once, it, once we realised it was, it was kind of rubbish, we just left it and, and moved on to something else. Uh, and obviously we did, uh, we did stuff about the 3DO when that came out because that was really interesting. But that was the, the – I think the good thing for me and also the reader – was that I think we naturally had very similar thought processes. And if I found if I found it was interesting, or you know Jason Brooks, who worked on the magazine, if he found it interesting, then it went in the magazine. And we just figured that if we like it, other people will like it. It did feel like an exciting time, like new systems coming along every like six months. Yeah, I mean, and also, you know, we, we were very lucky that we were, me and Jason were escorted down to Sony to see the PlayStation. What did you think when you you first saw it then? I think, uh, again, my recollection of it is we went down and they didn't have an awful lot. They showed us, but they did show us the the notorious T-Rex demo. Yeah which is a T-Rex stomping along on, on sort of walking on the spot on screen and you can you could move his his mouth and arms with a joypad and it was just like we've never seen stuff like this before 
you know this this is um you know and also you know Jurassic Park was was around about that time as well so there were lots of things all kind of coming together in terms of video games mirroring or kind of following in the path of where movies had been um and producing you know more and more incredible 3D graphics i think for, for me really early on i recognized the move to three dimensions i mean i'd always been a real massive fan of it even you know right from battle zone back on back in the coin ops um through the likes of mercenary and elite and all those kind of games i raw, i always thought that 3d was where it was going to be and then the playstation totally ushered in that era when you'd seen properly fully shady 3d games you just couldn't go back to 2d well, I've always found Edge a really interesting read. And even to this day, you know, when I see it, it's got interesting articles in there. But, I mean, over the, the decades that it's been on sale, it's occasionally got a bit of a reputation for being um, a bit pretentious at times, shall we say. Um, do you think that's that's fair? Oh, yeah, totally, yeah. Not my fault. Not my fault. That was, that was not how I wanted the magazine to be. Um, the idea was that to make it different, because obviously one of the things I wanted to do was just to have a point of difference from all the other games and magazines, which all felt like, like they'd all fallen out the same mould. And so instead of making characters uh, of the of the the writers so very much the antithesis of Total, we weren't going to put names on. And also, because it was meant to be a way for us to work as a team, that the opinions that went on reviews and went on previews would very much be something that we discussed as a team. It was really weird how... Other people who came onto the team, one side left, sort of took it and took it in this really odd direction where it become this, it became this aloof, slightly pretentious. I don't know what the term for it is really. This kind of just very, a very strange entity, and of course, to an extent, I suppose it would because you know it's been very popular and still sells up until now. But I didn't like the way the magazine went, if I'm honest. Uh, I, I just felt like it had gone, it started to believe its own hype mm. and it had become this kind of weird elitist thing that was just like I say, that the word aloof is just right. It just, it's, it's just this, this cold thing that you couldn't really kind of engage with. So I, I don't know, I, that's not the direction I would have wanted to take in. Well, you also edited Amiga Format for a while, taking over from Marcus Dyson and, and that was just as Commodore went bankrupt. So, um, how much did that kind of affect the magazine? At the time, uh, I mean, uh, Amiga Format was just selling, I don't know, between, uh, it, it was around the 100,000 mark. So Commodore could go bust. It wouldn't bother us one iota, really. Obviously, it had a sort of negative sort of feeling on the market. I think as soon as, soon as Commodore went down, I think most people with an Amiga kind of went, uh-oh, you know, the end, is, the end is nigh. But at the time, we had so much product and so many readers and so, you know, so many games and stuff. I mean, the, the, the Amiga ecosystem was still super vibrant. So I don't think it had a, had a massive effect when I was on the magazine. I think the biggest effect on the magazine was me being the editor because I was crap at it. And I did some really awful covers and I probably, I probably lost about 20,000 readers in the time I was on there. <laughs> it did last a long time. I think it was around, until around 2000, 2001 Amiga format after that. So. Well, like, like I say, you know, I mean, people loved their Amigas mm. and they, had, they kept bringing out, you know, there, there were processor upgrades and RAM upgrades and hard drive upgrades and new apps and all sorts of stuff. And because it was a proper computer, you know, they could keep uh, up, upgrading the OS and adding to it. So it had, yeah, it had a, it had a, a long lifespan. Uh, and it's a, it's, it's, it's a shame Commodore couldn't have capitalised on it. And, and, you know, that if they'd have, with some smart decision making, they could be where Apple is now, but sadly that's not the case. And the cover discs were always brilliant as well. I mean, was I right in thinking that there was kind of some unofficial agreement between magazines that you wouldn't give away games on the discs? Yes. Uh, I think, again, uh, yeah, that was about the time I was uh, you know, on a meek format. I think what had happened is that we were getting into, there were an awful lot of games magazines. And there were PC magazines competing with PC magazines. There were Amiga magazines and ST magazines. And they'd all reached the point where they're going, well, if you're going to put a free game on the cover, we'll put two free games. And, of course, we just get into a mutually assured destruction. It was also destroying the games market. People weren't buying games for the 16-bit machines. They were just buying magazines. 
So uh, we, I think there was, a, I think there was a, like a moratorium, and I think game developers, uh, it's all game publishers, and the magazine publisher got together and went, we have to stop this. This is bad. So uh, yeah, that's that's when that ended. And if anybody wants to get a look at Steve's time at Amiga Format, there are a couple of videos of you on YouTube. No, there aren't. <laughs> no, there aren't. Fortunately, they've all been wiped, gone forever. Very sad. But you, what you shouldn't do is try and search for them. Just don't, no, don't do that. So you had to do it was like um, videos they released, wasn't it? That were kind of like upgrading your machine. And did, oh, did you like presenting them? God. Then? <laughs> Why did you mention those things? Yeah, somebody, somebody, some, every now and then somebody will gleefully remind me of those, and I have to go and. Let's just move on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you became the launch editor of the official PlayStation magazine, and what a magazine that was in uh, late 1995. W- what was the launch like? I think by then I would start, I'd started to get a little bit better at making magazines. Uh, I think we had a really nice design. I think you look back at it, a lot of magazines I've done really have some strange font choices or typeface choices. Uh, and I think this, the same can be said of the official PlayStation magazine. But, uh, it, you know, you can, I think you, you look at it and you can see the influences from Total, Commodore Format and Edge all rolled up into the official PlayStation magazine. Because, again, we, couldn't, we weren't aiming it at young kids, but we didn't want it to be too old. So it was, it was still quite jolly. It was obviously a games magazine, but it was aimed at a certain kind of cool teen demographic kind of thing. And it, I thought it went really well. Again, had a decent team on board. Quite, you know, quite a few people involved with the production of the magazine. Uh, a good art editor uh, called Lam Tang, a Vietnamese guy who was great. He was he was the guy who imported the um, the Super Nintendo that I saw for the first time. And of course, we had the. <laughs> I mean, really, we could have. The truth is, we could have written anything in in the actual pages because we had a demo disc stuck to the front. Which of course was just the best thing in the world. Yeah, I was going to mention that next because I mean I remember we got a PlayStation. That was Christmas '95, and those cover CDs. I mean, they were a godsend to new PlayStation owners. They must have sold the mag on their own, didn't they? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't want to denigrate the work of the team because we worked hard and I think we did a nice magazine. But yeah, we had a demo disc stuck to the front. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I even I remember I had obviously had a PlayStation at the time, and I remember playing the demo of Demolition Der- Derby. Yeah, I think it was or Derby, um, and it was just a demo. I just sat and played a demo for hours and hours and hours, and I, I'm sure most people managed to get a good couple of weeks out of each demo disc. And of course, then another magazine would turn up, and they were whether they worked. In, um, as a marketing tool to sell video games, I've no idea, but they certainly sold magazines. I mean, they sold magazines to the point where, at one point, I mean, the official PlayStation magazine was shifting a, the best part of half a million copies. Wow. You know, it was selling more than FHM and GQ and that lot, and it was five or six quid, quid a pop. This wow. thing was just raking money in like you wouldn't believe. Well, I certainly remember all of my friends had a copy of Tony Hawk's, which would have a 10-minute timeout, and that was like the one game that we could all universally go around anybody's house and just play that little demo of Tony Hawk's. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's the thing. You know, I mean, if, if, the, if the game developer got it wrong and gave you too much game, that was, that was it could potentially be the kiss of death. I mean, I, I really hope it worked for some developers. I, I hope people would, went... The demo is brilliant. I love it, and I'll go and buy the game. But for us, it was just. Um, it, it, I mean, it was amazing for the magazine. It was. I think it was hard work for Sony, because obviously they had to get this stuff in. You you imagine, of course, that you got Sony UK at the behest of Sony headquarters in Japan, and they're trying to because we couldn't make these discs because these these were proprietary discs for the um, for the PlayStation. So Sony were was getting the code in, collating it, burning the disc doing the menu and then getting the disc out to duplication. So I think, it, you know, it was pretty tense on a couple of occasions whether the disc was actually going to arrive in time. But when, when, once we got going and they, they kind of got into their groove, it was, it was great. And, um, yeah, very, very successful magazine. 
Well, we'll look at this kind of decade, you know, we've talked about in this last hour that we've been talking, Steve. I mean, stuff like, you know, from Zap to PlayStation magazine. And in that time, I mean, you worked on some of the biggest titles in really the golden age of video games. And that decade saw so much change. I mean, did it ever kind of feel exhausting keeping up with it all? Like such rapid no, I change? D- I, yeah, I loved it. Yeah. I, 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 as, as somebody that's a bit of a technophile, um, it was great. I, I um, Like I say, it, it played to... I've, it, like my heartland the things I'm really into I, I love technology and gadgets I love movies and special visual effects and I love CG art and animation and I love video games and they all came together during this time period uh, so yeah I, I, it was it was uh, brilliant you know to be in and surrounded by this stuff it was very very exciting times yeah well, today, um, if people have been reading any Bitmap Books books, um, we may have seen your name in the credit. I mean, you've actually been working on a few of those with Sam and the team recently. Yeah, yeah, it was <laughs> the most bizarre thing, because I think it was the, the, the guy you mentioned before who was doing the Commodore format uh, online oh, Neil. archive. Yeah, yeah Neil. Uh, I think he, he dropped me a line saying, oh, there's a guy doing retro gaming books, and one of them is going to be a, a C64 book. You should get in touch, and maybe you can help. And I went, yeah, yeah. Why not? You know, it might be something interesting. Um, and it just the bizarre thing was he's, <laughs> he lives about 20 minutes away from my, where I do, sort of up the hill on the other side of Bath. And so obviously we, we got together and had a drink and I said, yeah, let me, you know, let me do some stuff for you. And so I act as editor for some of these books, which is, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's not, a, not a particularly specific role. I tend to advise him a little bit on book production because the kind of stuff he's doing isn't a million miles away from the stuff that we did on magazines. Mm. You know, I can be a fact checker and, you know, I've obviously got the skills that I, I gained from 20 years making, you know, print print publishing products. Um, and plus, I'm a gamer, you know, so um, obviously we, we did the C64 stuff, but we've also done Sega, uh, Neo Geo, Nintendo. So I've managed. To, I've, it's been nice that I've managed to help him on all these different products. But they're they're very much Sam's. It's Sam's gig. I'm just a, a paid lackey. Well, Steve, it's been great getting these stories. I mean, I speak as a kid who probably spent far too much of my pocket money on uh, magazines that you were involved with over the years. So <laughs> it was great that you you know you guys were there too. In that pre-internet age, I mean, magazines were so important as well. So it's it's been wonderful getting these stories about those there. Uh, those titles we all grew up reading. So thank you for coming on this week. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Thank you very much for asking me.